we're going to continue with the program now. Um, Scott Ryder and Jim Morgan are going to uh, talk about their adventure. Uh, I'm really excited to see this. Um, uh, Scott is a track star, three-time Big Ten champion, 800 meters, and uh, Jim is on the, the board of the Parkinson Foundation National, and they've been doing a, a, some really great work for the community. Um, we're going to start a video, and then they will come up and self-introduce and take it from there. Scott and I were co-chairing the uh, first annual Volunteer Leadership Summit for the Parkinson's Foundation several years ago. And we came up with this idea to really travel across the country and document the humorous, heartwarming, interesting stories about people with Parkinson's and people that were making life better for people with Parkinson's. We have a disease that gets worse every day. The Parkinson's Foundation has the tools and the resources to make life better today for people like Jim and myself that are battling this disease for which there is no cure at the time. The treatment really is education at the time of diagnosis and making sure that people understand that they are still who they are. The things they like are still what they like, the things they don't like, nothing changes uh, when they walk out of the office. They just have what's, what is going on having been labeled. Parkinson's is an incredibly isolating disease for a lot of people. It's so important that they be engaged you know, socially, uh, physically, and mentally. We really feel like our mission is to keep people you know, in the know, if you would, about new developments in, the, in Parkinson's disease. There's so many great things that are available to people, just like this facility in Red Ohio Health. I guarantee you there's a whole bunch of underserved out there in the community that would benefit from this. Well, I just think this is an incredible resource to be able to, to come out and, 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 and have the resources available that you guys are providing. It's just unbelievable. All right, you guys ready? <laughs> you know, the first thing you have to do <laughs> you make got, it to the stage. Yeah, that's true. But uh, um, speaking right after lunch to, to a group of people that have Parkinson's it carries a couple risks. Number one, you're probably really sleepy. I don't remember what I was going to say. Number two was so. Um, but I asked everybody to do one thing. I'm serious. Um, Jim, we speak all over the country to people. And I look out and I survey the audience and I notice one thing that always really makes me feel sad. Nobody's smiling. So smile, exaggerate that smile and feel happy. So I'm Scott Ryder. And I'm Jim Morgan. And we're? Parkinson's Across America. That's right. Well, Scott and I were each diagnosed about 16 years ago. And early on in our diagnosis, we became active supporters of the Parkinson's Foundation. In fact, Scott has been a leading fundraiser for the moving day and Parkinson's revolution events in Ohio and South Carolina, and in fact, you were the Volunteer of the Year last year for the Parkinson's Foundation nationally. Thank you. And as Dr. Hinkle mentioned, I'm currently a member of the Board of Directors, uh, the National Board of Directors of Parkinson's Foundation, and we're both members of the Development Committee. But we like to just say that we're just two ordinary guys with Parkinson's trying to make a difference. Well, I um, beg to differ a little bit about the two ordinary guys. Um, we get along really well. We spend a lot of time on the road together. And it's kind of like, um, do you remember the show The Odd Couple, Felix and Oscar? Or there's another analogy, and you should know, Jim graduated from law school. And I'm not embellishing. He was one of the top two attorneys in the nation um, in his area, which was um, finance of renewable energy, whatever that means. I, on the other hand, barely graduated from the Ohio State University. So I often say, Jim is like Winston Churchill, I'm like Larry the Cable Guy. Scott, but it works. Sometimes you flatter yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. That's not in the script either. It's not. <laughs> Sorry about that. So as, as we did mention in the video, we were the co-chairs of the first and second National Volunteer Leadership Summits of the Parkinson's Foundation. 
And Scott, I think it was you that first floated the idea that let's travel across the country and interview people about their life with Parkinson's disease and how they're living life to the fullest despite that diagnosis. And um, I don't know if it was a delusional moment of mine, but somehow I agreed because here we are. But we actually chartered one of the buses that transports rock bands and had planned on setting out on a 42-day adventure from Miami to Los Angeles. And then two months later, uh, COVID hit. And you know the story after that. So then COVID kind of got behind us and it was um, last summer. And we thought about a couple things. We thought, you know, being gone from home for 41 or 42 straight days may not be the best marriage plan. And we both wanted our wives to be there when we got home, so we revised our plan. And we said, we're gonna take out one week a month from June till five months later <laughs> in a 17 passenger van. And we did. So um, in June, we started in South Carolina and North Carolina. And then we went up to Ohio, Indiana. I won't take you through the whole journey, but we ended up in um, Manhattan Beach, California. We made a lot of stops, which we'll tell you about um, as we kind of progress through this presentation. But Jim, that was a lot of time on the road. It was, it was. Well, we did set out to film with a, with a film crew to document the humorous, heartwarming, and inspiring stories from people in all walks in the Parkinson's community to provide a personal yet informative look at what it means to be living Park, living life with Parkinson's disease today in the United States. More importantly, however, we were looking to provide hope and encouragement that despite a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, people could continue to live happy and productive lives. So Jim coined this phrase that we're gonna travel across America's heartland, and we truly did, and we were in some really remote locations and we're really excited with what we've captured. And we're going to bring you up to date kind of on where we are in this process. But I want to tell you first, don't expect to see a documentary today. I'm not a techie guy, but we had um, a couple terabytes of information. So that's um, a lot of information to sort through. Well, Scott, I, I think to begin, we would be remiss if we didn't stop and, and thank the, the sponsors who, through their generous support, made this possible. We, um, we uh, had contributed more than $200,000 to the filming and production of our documentary. Now our ultimate objective is to sell the video or the documentary to a streaming service with 100% of the proceeds to go to the Parkinson's Foundation. But today I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Hinkle because he was one of the first to jump on board and really um, help financially support in a major way and kind of before you really knew what it was all going to be about. We had this vision, but he entrusted in us. And there's a couple other people in the room I want to thank. Dr. Dave Rudrick, he played a role, which you'll see later on. And then um, our friend Jim Crager from Chicago, you've heard his name a couple times today. He's with us and he gave us a place to stay when we were filming in Chicago. And you bring five guys in, stinky film crew, stinky Jim and Scott. That was very nice of you, Jim. We'll Always should be appreciative of that. Well, as Scott mentioned, we set out in June of 2022 in a 17-passenger travel van. And when all was said and done, we traveled just shy of 8,000 miles. Now, that's three times the distance from Miami to LA. And that's without even taking into account the air travel that we all spent reaching the van in each of its locations. When you take all that into account, it was many multiples of 8,000 miles. Now, I know you're thinking that a 17-passenger van sounds pretty comfortable, but with five guys and a whole lot of camera equipment, I think we felt every one of those 8,000 miles. We did, and you have two guys with Parkinson's who um, family will not ride in the car with them when they drive. So um, that tells you a little bit about how um, we had some adventure. We did find a couple of ways to entertain ourselves. We did, and I'm, I'm, what I'm going to tell you is very serious. Jim is um, always thinking about how what we do might reflect upon the sponsors. I'm always thinking about how we can have fun and create some excitement. 
So um, prior to this trip, Jim had never um, ridden in a pickup truck. He'd never had breakfast at Subway, and he'd never had White Castle. I said, dude, <laughs> you never had White Castle. So we went, we, I think we were in Indiana somewhere, and we many White Castles are open 24-7. The middle of the night. The middle of the night, and the film crew's watching three of us eat White Castles, and it's a really great clip. I'm not going to share it with you today because we want you to see the documentary. But um, Jim, that was the first time in White Castle, but my favorite, besides the Las Vegas Strip experience, which I can't tell you about today, <laughs> but I can put it out there as a teaser, my favorite was when we were on the Ohio Turnpike, and Jim was driving, and we came up to a toll booth, and so myself and one of the crew members, we hatched this plan. We said, let's pretend like we're having a major major argument, having a, like a wrestling match in the car. And so we started talking a bunch of gibberish and Jim's trying to pay the toll booth. He can't hear the toll booth person talking. Then we started throwing dirty socks at him and potato chip bags, everything imaginable. And the lady looked at you and what did she say? She whispered, she said, are you okay? And I said, they need to be committed. I was sure that we were going to be followed by the highway patrol. Yeah. And as we drove away, we filmed this. You could see that lady trying to peer into the back of the van like, are you sure they're going to be OK? And by the way, I want to thank you for advancing the slides, because I already forgot about it. <laughs> I figured you would. So we've documented interviews with more than 400 people from all walks of life in the Parkinson's community. And to a person, everybody that we interviewed had a specific reason or reasons as to how they find hope and encouragement in the fight against Parkinson's. And there are several things that um, I learned. You know, I'm going to tell you, I, I thought I knew a lot about Parkinson's, but I didn't know the tip of the iceberg. But one thing that practitioners and therapists and trainers told us over and over, and you're all today representative of that, they said people with Parkinson's are very different than any other disease set that they know of. And what they mean by that, they said for the most part, the majority of people with Parkinson's are hard workers and dedicated to trying to fight the disease. And that was encouraging. And then the other thing we heard over and over again from the physicians is how much they enjoyed working with people with Parkinson's. And I'd never really thought of this. They said it's a lifetime relationship. It's not like a one and done. I mean, we had movement disorder specialists tell us how they've been invited to graduations, bar mitzvahs, you know, baptisms, um, everything possible. And they said they really felt satisfaction from having a lifetime relationship with a patient as opposed to, all right, I did this surgery and never see you again in your life. And I'd never really thought about that prior to this trip, Tim. Yeah, you know, you, you remember, Scott, this is a picture uh, of the presentation that we made at the Villages in Florida. It was the very first stop on our tour in June of 2022. The Villages is a very unique adult-oriented uh, community in Central Florida with uh, more than 9,000 residents. And it's estimated that as many as 3,000 people living in the Villages have Parkinson's or have some connection to Parkinson's. They actually have eight support groups, which is run by, remember her name was Rose Lang. Rose is just a dynamic and an incredible person who's committed to advocate for the Parkinson's community. Rose is also the care partner for her husband, who's living with Parkinson's. You know, Parkinson's can be an incredibly isolating disease, as we mentioned in the video. But at the Villages, we certainly learn the value of community when it comes to caring for each other with Parkinson's. And here's what you may not know about the villages. To be able to get a commercial film crew into villages is almost unheard of. If you go on Netflix, you'll see some very unflattering documentaries about the villages, which by the way, we did some research and it's, most of it's not true. And I don't know if you know what I'm thinking, but if you don't see me afterwards. Um, so the fact that we got in the villages was amazing. And they let us bring our film crew in, but they were so tight about things, we couldn't have their logo in, line, in the eyesight of any camera. It was amazing. But what an amazing group of people. And Rose, stays, you heard from Rose yesterday. That's right. We develop relationships on this trip, I think, that will last a lifetime. Now, before you go on to the next slide, Jim, I want to explain to everybody that we interviewed, like we said, nearly 450 people. 
And it was not easy when you're talking to that many people, uh, minute or hour after hour. And some people aren't that comfortable in front of the camera. And so I don't know why I started this. To get people loose, I say, hey, what's your favorite flavor, ice cream? And so it was really interesting, you know. You're thinking, what does ice cream have to do with Parkinson's? The answer is nothing. But I want you guys to guess, because I was blown away. Unanimous, 90%. What do you think? We started in Florida, all the way across the midsection of the country to California. What do you think the most common answer was? Let me just see. Butter, pecan, chocolate, what else? Right there, mint chocolate chip. So somebody buy her some Grater's mint chocolate chip. <laughs> I would have never guessed that, but I don't know why I wanted to share that with you. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Oops. Where are we, Jim? Well, I skipped too far ahead. I got a little too excited here. So we interviewed some of the most um, well-regarded practitioners in the world of Parkinson's and none um, more important or interesting or um, well-spoken than Dr. Hinkle. I love that video where Dr. Hinkle's striding down the hall, man. It's just, it's cool. I like that. And um, fascinating the information we garnered from these people. But to a person, every one of these persons was so welcoming and encouraging. And um, when you see the final product, you're going to see what they had to say about hope and encouragement because there is a lot of hope and encouragement. That really is true. I think two of the guys that stood out to me, Scott, were Dr. Zoltan Mari. Mari. Except his name always scared me. I know, his name does scare me. He's at the Lou Ruvo Center in Las Vegas. And um, Dr. Mari has a particular passion for bringing Parkinson's care to the underserved communities. And he's developed some very effective protocols and research in telehealth. And then we also met uh, Dr. Francisco Ponce at the Muhammad Ali Center in Phoenix. And Dr. Ponce, in, in fact, implanted the very first Boston Scientific DBS device that I have. But he also developed procedures to do DBS surgery with patients that are fully asleep through the entire procedure, unlike what I experienced when I was awake when the leads were being implanted in my brain. As you can imagine, um, we've gone over all this information for a variety of reasons, and I think this is kind of funny, you may not, but I can never remember this guy's name, Francisco Ponce, so I call him Ponce de Leon, that's how I remember it. Uh, he doesn't know I do that, by the way. He does now. Yeah. So we, we've, we visited 12 integrated health care facilities, including Ohio Health's Movement Disorders cl Clinic. Seven of the 12 facilities we visited are designated as centers of excellence of the Parkinson's Foundation. You know, Jim, um, we showed a picture of the Ohio Health Facility, and I'm not saying this to be patronizing or to, to be extra kind to Dr. Hinkle. I'm saying this with conviction, and I've said this in the past. Um, I get a little bit emotional saying it. If you have to have Parkinson's, and I don't live here anymore, so I'm somewhat hypocritical, but I don't think there's any better city in the United States than Columbus, Ohio, to have Parkinson's, and primarily because of this Ohio Health, that facility is absolutely, it's a one-stop shop. It's amazing. That's why I still come back here. I'm seeing my movement disorder specialist, one of Dr. Hinkle's partners on Monday. Um, so the facility, I hope you guys realize, if you live in central Ohio, the care for Parkinson's, the exercise programs. Um, that lady did get, what did that lady say when you were beating the balls though? She said you were too slow or something? Yeah, I think she, had, she said I had no coordination. But you're living, it's uh, true. It's kind of true. But, um, if you have to have Parkinson's, my point is, uh, I, we've traveled across the nation. I'm not gonna say this at any other presentation we do. There is no better place if you have to have Parkinson's since to live and receive care than Central Ohio. So you guys are very, very fortunate. By the way, Scott, remember that, that's right. The, uh, the modern looking building there on the left I is- I was um, to go in there. <laughs> the Leruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas. It's an award-winning building de designed by Frank Gehry. What'd you say about that building? I thought maybe there had been an earthquake or something before we got there and I, Really didn't feel comfortable stepping in the door, but it's pretty wild. You get inside, it's a normal looking building. So one of the things we wanted to do um, on this journey was 
learn more about some of the initiatives of the Parkinson's Foundation. And a couple of these are very personal to me. But on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see two people we interviewed, Diana and Bubba. Now, Diana's from Cleveland, Ohio, but she lives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and her husband's name really is Bubba. And they're aware and care ambassadors. So you heard earlier about that aware and care kit, or I like to call it the hospital kit, or the go kit. Um, they're ambassadors, and they have amazing stories, which we'll hear more about in the documentary, about the lives they've impacted by distributing that aware and care kit and how it's changed hospital stays for thousands of Americans. And they're just two of the people that volunteer their time to do that. That's right, Scott. I, and I, I, I think another initiative that I particularly resonate with is the initiative for newly diagnosed patients. You know, the foundation fills the void of critical information that patients lack regarding their recent diagnosis. Now, I'm confident that none of your patients could say this, Dr. Hinkle, but if they did, if it was because they weren't listening. But in my case, you know, the diagnosing physician is often too busy or lacks the courtesy to, to provide a significant explanation of how to live uh, a quality life with Parkinson's disease. Well, the Parkinson's Foundation provides vast amounts of information and support as well as an introduction to an incredible community of like-minded people as part of their duly, newly diagnosed kit. And um, I believe that Laura's got those on the table outside. So um, if you'll stop by and you can pick one up there. So you reference was made earlier to this thing called PD generation. So if you look up on the right-hand side of the screen, what's her name, Jim? Mandy. I can never remember, thank you. Mandy, um, this really gets personal for me. So um, I did the PD generation test. They test seven genes. They look for variants in those seven genes. And you have a um, genetic counseling meeting beforehand and afterhand, afterwards, and um, that was my genetic counselor. So she was the one, before I opened the envelope, called and said, Scott, there are no variants in your genes. Now that's no guarantee for anything, but it's better than having issues with the genes. So, we sat down with Mandy face to face in her office in Indianapolis, and the stories she had to tell about the lives that have been impacted are just yeah. breathtaking. You know, we also interviewed innovators in the treatment of people with Parkinson's disease through the development of programs like Rock Steady Block, Rock Steady Boxing, and Delay the Delay Disease. And we've heard so often this morning that staying active is key to more good on time in Parkinson's. Jim, I don't know if you remember, in one of the places we were, and I can't remember, so that's a good thing, but there was an opera singer, and um, they had this, I don't know what I call them, alligator clip, but they had a clip hooked to this lady's ear, and they were putting electrical pulses through it. There was some testing, and they showed us her hand, she had had a stroke, I think, and they showed us her handwriting like two weeks before, then her handwriting um, two weeks after they were doing this test. And um, they're now using the same testing in the movement disorder area, specifically Parkinson's. So being exposed to those kind of things really offered hope and it encouragement. Really did. It really did. So um, we stopped by Indianapolis, the headquarters of Rocksteady Boxing. We got in the ring and put the gloves on. We really did, the two of us. And um, I'm not going to tell you the results of what happened. You're going to have to see the documentary. It was not pretty, I will tell you that. I won that bout. No, not, we'll, not to... We'll wait and see. Yeah, right. Editing is a magical thing. Yeah, it is. So the picture on the left is of a class at In Motion Wellness Center. Many of you might know that of In Motion. It's located in Beechwood, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. And it's through exercise, arts, support, and education that In Motion helps their clients to live positively and constructively with Parkinson's disease. But Jim, you know what I think I want to share about In Motion to everybody that's sitting here? One person, and each one of you are those one persons, can make a big difference in the lives of many people and the story of emotion was this lady was um, 
I think an OBGYN, and she um, diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so that ended her practice, and she said, I'm going to do something about this. Now, she had the help of many people, but it was her idea. It's a beautiful center. They have no charge for people to attend there. They have everything from art therapy to exercise. But one person in Beechwood, Ohio, decided they want to make a difference in the lives of others. It really does, and it, it really reflects the power of holistic community-based approach to wellness for people with Parkinson's and their families. And as I recall, Scott, all of their programs are entirely free. They are. Hey, we have 18 minutes left. Do I have time for a joke? Sure. Um, how many of you heard me speak before? Oh, good. So a couple of real quick stories. Um, I graduated from the Ohio State University. You know they have the School of Veterinary Medicine. You guys probably already know this. Do you know about the bovine study? No? Dr. Ankle, do you know about no. Yeah, bovine or cattle. Did you know it? at the Ohio State University right here in Columbus, they discovered that cattle have um, Parkinson's. Isn't that crazy? You know what they call it? Beef jerky. <laughs> okay, Jim, we better move on. 8,000 miles. <laughs> hey, do you know what's black and all over the place? Your handwriting. My signature. <laughs> Oh, there was one other story, though, that is interesting that I wanted to share with you guys. And this was a few years ago when I still lived in Columbus. There was a direct flight from Los Angeles to Columbus and back and forth. So I was going to Los Angeles. You probably remember this. I do. Going there to speak. Now, this was a few years ago. And when you're my age, you get off the plane, where's the first place you head? <laughs> Absolutely. So I don't mean to be crude by head to the, to the urinal. I remember this was a few years ago. I looked on my left, unbelievable, Michael J. Fox. Well, of course, Los Angeles, it's not that big a surprise it kind of was. I looked to my right, it was Muhammad Ali. I thought, dang. You know what? I looked down, I was wearing flip-flops, and I knew it was going to be a bad day. If you, don't <laughs> if you don't understand it, come see me afterwards. So, Jim, neither one of us have had professional media training. <laughs> As they can tell, right here, right? <laughs> that came into play at least once. But, um, remember, we... We want to encourage, we want to discover hope and encouragement. We also want to increase awareness. When you think about somebody who's diagnosed with Parkinson's every six minutes, that's staggering. It's got to change. So awareness is important. So contact with the media is important. And so we were live, um, no, we were not live. We were interviewed in um, Chicago outside of Northwestern University, Channel 10 here locally a couple times. Um, but Jim, there's one particular situation that was... I don't even know what to say. <laughs> well, it, we, it happened in Denver. We were in Boulder doing a, a presentation. We got a call late in the, the day, and they said, could you do an interview at Channel 9 NBC in downtown Denver? And we raced downtown. We said, sure. I mean, everything was fair game. We said, sure. We ran downtown, ran into the newsroom. They mic'd us up, and they did the interview. And we thought, well, we did okay, and you know that'll be okay once they edit it. Well, this is a picture of us just after the female reporter said to us, what are you guys, nuts? That was live. So uh, I said something stupid, which I know you can imagine by now. And I said, Jim, don't worry, they can edit that out. <laughs> she said, guys, you're just on live. There is no editing. Anyhow. I was out for a while, brief spell of COVID, and you found yourself in Colby, Kansas. Yeah, How did that anybody happen? here ever been to Colby, Kansas? No, I already know the answer. It's in the middle of nowhere. So the story goes back to my buddy Jim Crager. We were at an event in Chicago that Jim hosted. Jimmy Choi was there. Bill Bucklew was there. It was kind of like the who's who of Parkinson's. And this guy walks up to me with a, hand, with a note, says, you've got to call this lady in Colby, Kansas. I said, why? He said, please just call her. So I called this lady, her name is Elaine. And I will tell you, it echoes sort of what I said about Rose from the villages. Elaine is in the middle of nowhere in Kansas and her husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And she said, I'm gonna make a difference. And if you knew the programs that she's created that have impacted the whole state of Kansas. So she was talking to me and I, she said, we live in farm country. She said, my husband's a hobby farmer. I said, oh really? 
Um, my parents grew up on farms, so I know a little bit about farming, enough to be dangerous. I said, how many acres? I'm thinking, you know, 100 acres. He said, he's just a hobby farmer, has 2,000 acres. I said, oh, okay. I said, finally, I said, I'll tell you what, Elaine, we'll come to Colby, Kansas. I'm, I'm not embellishing. I said, if you make me a lemon meringue pie and homemade noodles. I got there, and there was a lemon meringue pie and homemade noodles, and half the town was there, too. And we had dinner with half the town. But Elaine arranged for um, an interview at the local radio station, which was kind of scary because um, we have a picture, but we're not going to show you today. It's three letters that were like Q triple X. I thought, oh, triple X. I don't know if this <laughs> is the best radio station, but they interviewed us 25 minutes live on the radio, went all over rural Kansas, and um, it shared hope and encouragement. It was very encouraging. So in addition to our presentation at the Villages, we participated in a live webinar hosted by the Boulder Community Health System in Boulder, Colorado. A live presentation to the employees of Boston Scientific at their Valencia, California headquarters. Which, by the way, was a first. Nobody had ever presented to their employees. Yeah. No PWPs, persons with Parkinson's, had never presented live to their employees, and their employees loved it. We also uh, remember we did the live post, uh, podcast hosted by the twitchy woman in Beverly Hills who Dr. Corcos was referring to. Yeah, that was pretty wild to be, Jim said I'm like Larry the Cable Guy. I, the whole time I was in this lady's backyard, I'm thinking Beverly Hillbillies, I, I'm gonna fit right in. We're doing this podcast in the back of this lady's front yard in Beverly Hills, California. Right. You fit in, but I was kind of not so comfortable. Um, Jim, I think one of the most touching things on the entire trip for me personally was a presentation, unexpected, that was made to Jim. So down inside Jim's head is some Boston Scientific hardware. When I first met Jim, he was all over the place, so I'm not exaggerating. Um, today, he's a miracle of modern medicine and DBS in Boston Scientific. And um, what Boston Scientific did is they tracked down the people that manufactured Jim's devices and your controller, is it on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> on the trip, if I get mad at Jim, I take his remote out and turn it off. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I thought about it. No, they, That's the, why I hit it. The Boston Scientific people tracked down the people in Puerto Rico and Ireland that manufactured, had some hand in his device, and they all posed for a picture, and they presented you a plaque with their picture, and that was it's really special. That was very emotional. Was really, really special. Well, um, we talked about the twitchy woman, Sharon Krischer. Sharon lives in California and partners with the Parkinson's Wellness Fund to ensure that there is funding to offer peer support for women with Parkinson's. Now hers is one of the, has been recognized as one of the top Parkinson's blogs to follow. And this is a picture of Scott and me participating in one of her regular podcasts. Uh, that she hosts every Sunday morning for women living with Parkinson's. But we were the first live podcast she had ever done. Post-COVID. In her backyard. <laughs> so we also interviewed some famous people with Parkinson's disease, and they included Brent Peterson. Now, Brent is, uh, was a first-round draft pick for the Detroit Red Wings, he was also uh, later an assistant coach for the Nashville Predators. And on the eve of being promoted to a head coach in the NHL, Brent was diagnosed with Parkinson's, ending his hockey career. Now, rather than sit back and just kind of lick his wounds, he and his wife, Tammy, founded Peterson's for Parkinson's, which is a foundation dedicated to bringing information and services to the Parkinson's community in and around Nashville, Tennessee. I'm proud of you. Jim knows this much about sports. He doesn't know the difference between the blue line and the end zone line. So the fact that you knew he was a first round draft pick is pretty impressive. Um, if you don't know Dr. Dave Rudrick, you should meet him. He's one of my inspirations. He's one of the first persons that reached out to me when I was diagnosed. And he arranged for us to meet a Central Ohio notable person by the name of Craig Taylor. So I grew up in the Columbus area and Craig Taylor is a household name, great basketball star for the Buckeyes, the voice of the Buckeyes. And um, again, thanks to Dr. Dave Rudrick, we sat on the center floor of St. John Arena with Craig Taylor, who used to be the voice of the Buckeyes. 
And um, it was emotional, to say the least, and it was inspiring at the same, same time. So thank you, Dr. Day, for arranging that. That's um, going to be a big part of the story. And then um, we also, in Phoenix, Arizona, met up with a former Buckeye football player named Ray Ellis. Ray played for Ohio State. He played for the Eagles, and he played for the Browns. And if you ever followed him much, he's probably most famous for knocking Tony Dorsett out cold in a game. And by the way, Ray's not particularly proud of that, but he did tell us, he said, Tony Dorsett said, I don't care, I played the second half. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. And then we met Jimmy Choi. We made reference to him earlier. He's well known for being um, an American Ninja Warrior five times. So we met some notable people, and then we met a whole lot more just regular folk. Yeah, we, we interviewed some people that were that are not famous for you know, famous for what they've done in their lives, but are as well living productive and fulfilling lives despite their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. For example, Scott, you'll remember that in Charlotte, we met with the first ever all-male African-American support group. And we talked about the unique issues that face people living with Parkinson's disease in their community. And it's a prevalent theme among the African-American community African-American men in particular with Parkinson's, that they perceive that somehow that they're being punished for something that they, uh, they really don't know what they did. Um, but it really has a chilling effect on their willingness to reach out for help and support. Jim, I don't know if you remember, but the gentleman pictured in the top left do you remember how long he had stayed secluded in his home? Ten years. Ten years. He never left his home so he got to be part of this support group. Well, it's, it, it's stories like his, too, that um, were incredibly heartbreaking. But they were also very encouraging when they shared that they derived great peace and hope when they were finally able to accept Parkinson's. And not because of anything that they may have done wrong or because of something to be ashamed. But it really emphasized to us, you know, the cultural impact upon people's perceptions and willingness to seek cure. Similarly, we interviewed Radhika and Dharma Iyer. That's the couple in the, uh, the Indian American couple in the lower right, right left hand corner. They, um, they shared that because of the cultural influences of their community, particularly a common belief in karma, that people tend to shy away from seeking support and sharing with others. And again, a very real impediment to treatment uh, that, is, that is thrown up by societal and cultural barriers. You know, Jim, as I look around, I see most everybody here has somebody with them, probably a care partner. I know you have your wife, Missy. I have Kelly that helps me button my shirts and do all the things I can't do. But we met a couple here in central Ohio who both have Parkinson's, a husband and wife. Imagine that. That would be a different way of living, wouldn't it? I have so much admiration for those people. Um, okay, I've got five minutes and 33 seconds left, and I've got two great stories. So we're at a gas pump. I don't know where. North Carolina, I think. I honestly don't remember where. Um, you weren't with us for some reason. I'm pumping gas, and I have no idea why, but I peeked around the other side to see who was pumping gas. And I see this guy wearing a Johnny Bench shirt. And I said, Johnny Bench? He said, you know who Johnny Bench is? I said, I know who Joe Morgan is, Dave Concepcion, Tony Perez. I rattled off all the reds from my days. And this guy was just infatuated, that I, just intrigued that I would know all this. And then he looked at my shirt, and he got real sober, and he said, Parkinson's? He said, I was just diagnosed two weeks ago. I said, you're kidding and he was with his son and his wife, and they're on their way to Emerald Island, North Carolina, or someplace. And um, I said, well, where do you live? He said, you've never heard of it. It's a place called Zanesville, Ohio. I said, oh, you mean the home of Tom's Ice Cream Bowl, Con's Potato Chips, and the Y Bridge? And I did. I rattled it off. I thought he was going to cry. But here's what we learned. He didn't know what a movement disorder specialist was. He didn't know the importance of exercise. He didn't know about PD generation. He didn't know about the wear and care kit. He knew virtually nothing. And we carried a lot of that stuff with us. We loaded him up with information and we loaded him up with hope and encouragement. And that was an encounter at the gas pump. And then Jim, I'm gonna take the liberty to tell the other one real quick. Okay. So um, one of the times, I don't remember which time, 
By the way, how many of you wish you could have been with us in the van? <laughs> yeah, you might have second thoughts, but it was, it was fun. But um, this will make you wish you weren't with us. I'm an hour and a half down the road going north. Actually, I was coming to Ohio, and I realized I forgot my meds. Oh, crap. And if I'd show you my meds, it's a long strip. So uh, long story short, I called somebody back in home, and they met us halfway. But we stopped at a gas station that we never would have stopped at had I not forgot my meds. I really believe this encounter was meant to be. So we stopped because there was a subway there. So I went inside the subway, and we're standing in line. There's one guy making sandwiches. It was a Sunday afternoon. He was slower than molasses. And I'm going to be really straightforward. Inside, I was like, come on, man, we got to get going. Get that lettuce on there quicker. You're going way too slow. And I don't know what came over me. I got the cash register. I calmed down. I have no idea why I said what I said. I said, hey, man, do you know what Parkinson's is? It was kind of like the other gas station. There was this long silence, he said. I was just diagnosed two weeks ago. I said, you've got to be kidding. At that same time, his coworker who was supposed to be there an hour earlier walked in. This guy literally ripped off his subway uniform. He said, I'm coming out and talking to you guys. Same thing, he knew nothing about Parkinson's. We loaded him up with information and material. And I think we gave him hope and encouragement. Well, you weren't there, so you don't know, but, but we did. The two gas station encounters, just crazy. All right, Jim, we got to pick up the pace. <laughs> sure, thanks. <laughs> so um, we also interviewed amazing care partners and explored the unique issues that, that are faced by them. On the, on the left is a picture of Terry Brubaker in the adaptive boat that he built for his wife, Nancy. Terry and Nancy seem to be happiest when they're on the waters off the coast of Hilton Head in North Carolina, where they live. South Carolina, right? South Carolina, last yeah. time I checked, Hilton Head was in South Carolina. So it, it was a one of a kind creation. Terry thought about everything, every detail to ensure that Nancy could enjoy their passion together despite her limited mobility due to Parkinson's. From a power lift on the stern that raises and lowers to accommodate Nancy's wheelchair to openings that are step free to a state-of-the-art gyro-powered stabilizing system, the yacht spirit represents the labor of love of a dedicated care partner. And it truly was a remarkable boat. No doubt, it's a beautiful boat. Um, then we let, if you look on the screen, there's a pretty young lady in the middle of two, I don't even know how to describe those two guys. But anyway, um, her name is Mara Horton. Oddly enough, or interesting enough, Mara's from back, Baxley, she went to Bishop Hartley High School, and she was married to Don Horton. Don has since passed. Don was a college football coach, including assistant coach at Ohio State. He was coach at North Carolina State, and this is a wild story. So Don had developed Parkinson's disease when he's at North Carolina State, and um, he was always the last person to get on the bus because it took him forever to get dressed. A matter of fact, you may recognize this name, a young man named Russell Wilson. You guys recognize that name? Russell Wilson was helping him button his shirts. Russell went to Mora, his wife, and said, you got to do something. Coach is holding up the team bus. I don't mind helping him. But... So she invented a line of shirts or clothing, if you haven't seen them, that are magnetic. I'm going to sh- No, I'm not kidding. I'm not going to show you. But they literally just self-snap. They're amazing. I should have brought one. And um, she did the ultimate. She saw a problem, turned it into an opportunity, really all out of love for her husband. Her story is very inspirational, and it's kind of cool because she's from Central Ohio. All right, so our team, I'm going to skip through some of these, but we have a pretty diverse team, but our chief videographer is Taylor Horton. And all I would tell you to do is Google Taylor Horton, Great White Shark. Taylor is best known for doing the videography for a guy that holds the world record for catching the largest great white shark with a rod and reel. He's a true adventurer, and he's really creative. And he's doing our editing process now. Um, everybody else is from South Carolina with the exception of Bryce. Bryce is a young man who's graduating from Thomas Worthington in about two weeks. And he spent the tri- whole trip with us. And I don't want to use the word gopher because that wouldn't be respectable to Bryce. But he would do anything we needed, um, including putting the window coverings on the van when we were on the road. Um, he was so helpful, so encouraging, so creative. And if you fell asleep, he'd stick a french fry in your nose or your ear. 
And then um, I'm not going to talk about Blurry Stat Blaustein right now out of time, but if you want to go to our website, you can. The biggest thing that's happened to us in the last 60 days is we received an email from a guy named Eric Limon. 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 That's how he pronounces it. He does. <laughs> and um, Eric is the executive producer for a show, for hundreds of shows, but The Deadliest Catch, Axemen, Jim's favorite show, Pitbull and Parolees. Hardcore Pawn is another, I said Hardcore Pawn, but lots of big time shows. And he um, was at a moving day event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then heard about our story. And he called up and he said, I want to help you guys. So he's the one that's going to help us take it to market. And he thinks there's a chance we could fetch up to $700,000 for this documentary, which we're donating to the Parkinson's Foundation. So we'll see. That's yet to come. So, I mean, Scott, we, these are just a few of the many, many stories that uh, we have uh, on tap. And, they, you know, so many of these stories include aspects of tremendous heartbreak and difficulty. But each offers incredible hope and encouragement to those of us in the Parkinson's community. One of the common things that I think resonated with me and with you as well was... Um, you know, despite the difficulty that people living with Parkinson's disease cope with every day, there was an incredible sense of gratitude to a person for people like people at uh, Ohio Health that are, you know, go to work every single day to make life better for people with Parkinson's. And that's really a testament to what you guys do. So, so what's next? This is the last slide. We're a little bit over time, but I'm... Um... We're hoping to get this in the marketplace, so hopefully you'll see on Netflix, HBO, Stars, somewhere like that, the first quarter of 2024. The editing process, I'm just going to tell you straight up, is far more involved than I ever anticipated or understood, but it's going to be amazing. And I mentioned our ultra, ultimate objective is to sell it to a streaming service to benefit the Parkinson's Foundation. But really our ultimate objective is to let the America know, and maybe the world, I'll tell you about that in just a second, to let America know that if you have Parkinson's, it's not the end of life. It's a new way of living life. And there's thousands and thousands of reasons to have hope and encouragement. And everybody we interviewed shared those reasons with us. This last picture was our, one of our last stops. It was in Manhattan Beach, California, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And Bryce scribbled out Parkinson America in the sand. And um, it was kind of the perfect finish to the trip looking out over the ocean. The sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. And um, I'll always be grateful for the opportunity made possible by Ohio Health and other sponsors. And we thank you for listening to two kind of goofy guys up here. But um, we both have Parkinson's. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you a lot. So I told Dr. Hey, if I told Dr. Hinkle that I was going to do this thing where I was going to toss stuff out, and we decided not to. Maybe I ask you. Oh, maybe I will. There's one right there. Oh, so if it doesn't fit you, find somebody that it fits. So, Dr. Hinkle, I'm going to leave that with you because we're like five minutes over. You're great. Thank you a lot. Thank you.